Welcome to the 134th episode of the Reading and Writing Podcast. I'm your host, Jeff Rutherford. Stay tuned for my interview with Alan Gratz, the author of seven novels for young adults. Alan's latest novel is Prisoner B3087. And also, Alan's first novel, Samurai Shortstop, was named one of the ALA's 2007 Top 10 Best Books for Young Adults. Stay tuned for my interview with Alan Gratz. Welcome back to the Reading and Writing Podcast. My guest today is Alan Gratz. Alan has written several young adult novels. His latest novel, available in bookstores now, is Prisoner B3087. Alan, welcome to the podcast. Hey, Jeff. Thanks for having me. Sure, sure. Well, if someone listening hasn't heard about Prisoner B3087 yet, how would you describe the novel? Uh, I guess I would tell them that it is the true story. Uh, it, it's it's a novel, but it's uh, based on the true story uh, of a man who, as a boy, survived 10 different concentration camps during World War II. Wow, that's my short version. Um, <laughs> the The long version is that uh, there's a man who's still alive. His name is Jack Gruner. He lives in Brooklyn, and he brought his story uh, to Scholastic, and originally just thought that they would want to publish it as a a nonfiction work, you know, just a biography. And they came to me and asked me if I would turn it into a novel. And so I worked with his notes and then uh, met him and worked with him and his wife, Ruth, uh, to, uh, to try and write a story that was both uh, – that, that, that was true to his life story but also a little broader so that we could include a little bit more of the overall experience that, that many people had uh, – that many Jews had in the, during the Holocaust um, – and also to make it a little bit more of a of a narrative, you know, nobody's life story makes a a perfect story, and so to turn it into a novel, we had to do a, a few things to change things here and there. But for the most part, really, prisoner is um, is Jack's story. Wow, um, that must have been amazing meeting him and 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 talking to him about his experience. It was. It was really moving. Uh, I had. Um, I had been working on the book for a little while based on his notes and had been able to, of course, speak to him and his wife via email and, and on the phone. But I, it wasn't until um, I had really gotten into the – well into the first draft of the book that I was able to get to New York and meet him. And um, we spent an afternoon, uh, my family and his family, uh, touring – the uh, the National Holocaust Museum in, or I'm sorry the the Holocaust Museum I think there's a National Holocaust Museum in Washington but we we toured the the Holocaust Museum that's in New York City and uh, um, it was a an incredibly moving afternoon uh, to be with him and to to hear his memories uh, about his time during the war but also to to be there in the museum where there were um, so many other experiences on display sure. Sure. Well, well, obviously, it, it goes without saying that the Holocaust is is a grim subject, and you're writing a young adult mm-hmm. novel. Um, how how did you approach that issue? Was it a challenge for you to 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 tackle such a um, you know such a grim subject in in your writing for a YA audience? Yeah, it was absolutely difficult, and uh, this is even um, this was even more middle grade than YA, and so. Um, I, I was I was faced with trying to accurately portray the horrors of the Holocaust to a very young readership, and I really didn't want to pull any punches um, because I I thought that really would do a disservice to the memory of the people uh, both who survived it and who 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 died during the Holocaust. Uh, but at the same time, I have to of course be very sensitive to the fact that I'm writing for younger readers. Um, just on a personal level, it's. Uh, not a topic I probably would have chosen to write about. I would have sought out on my own if Scholastic had not come to me and asked me to uh, to work on this book. Uh, it, it's it's darker than I like to write about. Um, I have I've written some things in the past for freelance work that have um, that have been darker. Uh, I wrote for a TV show called City Confidential that was on A and E for many years, and um, it was about real life murders. It was a documentary style show and, and they would wait for a murder uh, court case to be resolved. And then they would go back and tell the story from beginning to end. 
And sometimes these were pretty grim, and those were written for an adult audience, but I still had sometimes a, a, a real struggle writing those. And so I knew going into this project that this was going to be difficult. And, you know, when you write a historical novel, you really have to immerse yourself in in every facet of that time period. You really have to read as much as you can and get as many uh, get as much information as you can. And I knew that for for a, a time in my life, I would really have to immerse myself in the Holocaust. And that's not a pleasant prospect, as you've pointed out. Um, it, it's an important one. There's no doubt about that. And that's one of the reasons that I that I um, that I wanted to be a part of this project. But uh, it was difficult. Uh, there were there were days when I got done writing and was just like, okay, I need a family hug. Everybody yeah. gather around, and, <laughs> um, you know, hug the wife and daughter very yeah. close. And um, it, it was uh, it was a challenge, um, but at the same time, I, I I hope that what I was able to do is to present the 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 Holocaust, particularly Jack's experiences through these ten different concentration camps, in a in a very realistic way um, and, and a, a very honest way. So that kids wouldn't um, wouldn't have it sugar coated at all. Sure. And so, what has Jack's reaction been since he since you finished the novel? I'm really pleased that both Jack and Ruth have um, have really embraced the novel and and have written to me and expressed their gratitude over it. That was really important to me from the start. That, of course, as a as a novelist, I wanted to take the the story and and make it into my own. But in this project. That was a challenge because this isn't my own. It's Jack's story. And so I had to constantly remind myself that no matter no matter what choices I wanted to make with the novel, I needed to make sure that they were choices that Jack and Ruth would be comfortable with. And um, I'm really pleased that they they are pleased. Uh, they, they've really been excited about the final result. And I do think that it is um, – I, I think that Scholastic's instincts were right to turn this into a novel rather than than nonfiction because I think it makes it all that much more dramatic than just a, a retelling of his life story. So I think they're pleased with the final result. They had not expected it to be a novel when they took it to Scholastic, but I think ultimately they are even even happier with the final product than they would have been had it just been a biography. That's great. So, so earlier you mentioned that this is a middle grade novel versus why if, <laughs> if someone listening um, is not kind of familiar with the, the publishing business, especially the, 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 the um, publishing business for children and young adults, what would be the technical difference in your mind of a middle grade versus YA book? Sure. Middle grade is uh, what a lot of people associate with the Newbery Award. So, you know, books like uh, classically like Charlotte's Web or, or modern books like Holes by Lewis Saker would be middle grade. Um, it's it's more a shelving convention by, by bookstores and libraries, but also some content. Uh, it's really for books that I would classify as for ages 8 to 12 at uh, middle grade. And then when you get into YA, that's when you get into the 12 and up. And even within young adult, there are upper YA and lower YA. So you may have books that are for 12-year-olds that would work both for middle graders and for young adults. Uh, my Samurai Shortstop, my first book, Samurai Shortstop, really falls into that category. I, I believe it it works well for 7th and 8th graders who are at the top end of middle grade, but also for high schoolers who are squarely in young adult. Whereas um, then you have upper middle grade, I'm sorry, upper YA, which is really kind of a 14 and up, and that's got your sex, drugs, and rock and roll. I mean, that's the that's the stuff that that uh, is really pushing the envelope uh, for for younger readers. So, uh, you know, th- just a, a basic definition: middle grade eight, ages eight to twelve, and young adult ages twelve and up. But within those, there are even degrees of <laughs> of complexity. Gotcha. Yeah, you know, uh, and and there now that you know some some bookstores and and uh, libraries are actually having a tween section, and they're taking those books that really fall in that seventh and eighth grade range and making those tween books because they are between middle grade and, and young adult. Uh, and now we're we're hearing about a new thing called new adult that is yeah, yeah, taking the that. young adult and and pushing that up into the twenty somethings. So um, it's it's a further fracturing of the age groups. Exactly. But but the traditional model and and I guess the easiest way to look at it too is that is that award situation. The Newbery is often for uh, middle grade novels, and the Prince Award was established to really recognize young adult novels. And so th- sometimes you get a book that gets both awards, and that's one of those tween books. But right. Um, for prisoner, I really wanted 
uh, I really wanted Prisoner to be um, one that could be used all the way down to the bottom of middle grade. Um, so that this could really be used in schools, you know, in third, fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh, eighth, anywhere in that range. You know, third's probably a little young for it, but but that fourth through eighth grade uh, reader, and then on up. I mean, one of the great things about middle grade, in my opinion, is that they read up. I mean, they don't have the sex, drugs, and rock and roll of of, of young adult, but they're still great books, and I I really love reading middle grade as an adult. So um, I think that middle grade has a really broad readership or can have a really broad readership. Right, right. Well, well, I know that, you know, as we've discussed, you, you write young adult books. Did you, when you first started writing, did you deliberately set out to write YA novels or is that just the type of ideas that you gravitated to? Um, you know, I, I, I did set out to write for young readers. Um, I had been, I'd been trying to write many different things earlier on before I had ever really sold anything. I was writing plays. I was writing comic books. I was writing TV scripts. Um, and with the exception of, of some later freelance work, like I said, for City Confidential, I never sold any of those TV scripts. I never sold any of the comic books. I did have some of my plays produced on the local level. But so I was writing, was writing at that point anything I was interested in. And then in the late 90s, um, my, my wife and I met when we were working at a bookstore and uh, she continued to work in the bookstore while I went I- into different careers. And um, she became the children's book and toy buyer for a group of bookstores. And in the late 90s, she was bringing home galleys of what was then what were then contemporary middle grade and young adult books. And she'd be like, read this, read this, read this. These are great. And I was already a, a fan of of kids' books. I mean, I, I read the popular ones when they came out and, and uh, didn't have any sort of stigma against them. But when she was bringing me things like The Golden Compass and Speak, and I was reading these, and I was like, wow, these are fantastic. And I was seeing the the sort of renaissance for middle grade and YA. And I, I kind of made a decision right then. I, I said, you know what, I'm going to put away all this other stuff that I've been working on, all the, you know, the, the adult novels, the the screenplays, the the – the plays, the comic books, all that stuff. And I'm going to focus just on writing for kids. And I guess that was in perhaps like 1997 or 1998. And I really, I really put everything else aside and started focusing on writing books for young readers because I enjoyed them so much. I really enjoyed what I was reading and wanted to be a part of that. And um, it took me, I guess, until 2006 to sell my first novel uh, for kids. Um, And, uh, had been, you know, writing books and, and sending them out and getting rejection letters and getting what I call good rejection letters, rejection letters from a- editors that would say, we like your writing, but this is quite, isn't quite the project for us, or we just published a book like this, send us your next book, we really like your writing. So I, I felt like I was getting good bites from editors and uh, eventually uh, wrote the book that that was my breakthrough novel, Samurai Shortstop. I guess uh, it took me a number of years to do that, but I just kind of stuck stuck with it and hung in there and joined a number of professional organizations like uh, SCBWI, the Society of uh, Children's Book Writers and Illustrators, that really helped me get my start by teaching me how to be more professional and how to approach editors and agents. Gotcha. And what what kept you going during that period? I mean, you you just described from like 1997 to like 2006. What 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 kept you going? I'm sure there was probably some you know. Uh, dispiriting times of of getting rejections. Sure, um, and and I wasn't writing full time at this point. I had other careers, of course. You know, I couldn't afford to just take ten year, almost ten yeah. years off, and try and sell a novel. <laughs> right. That'd be nice. Yeah. <laughs> if I were in that position, I don't know that I'd need to do anything, frankly. Yeah. Um, but uh, yeah, it was dispiriting many times. Uh, and and I remember one day in particular when we were living in Atlanta, I went to the mailbox and, and got two rejection letters for the same novel in the same day. And one of them said, love the characters, don't like the plot. And the other one said, love the plot, don't like the characters. And, um, <laughs> you know, yeah. to get to get two rejections on the same book in the same day that 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 rejected it for entirely different reasons, um, just pointed out how subjective and, and how um, how lucky you have to be to find the right person for the right book uh, and and to have all the sort of planets aligned to, to sell your first book. Um, at the same time, I have always wanted to be a writer. I wanted to be a writer since I was a little kid and found my grandfather's old typewriter in the garage and started banging away and teaching myself to type. 
Uh, I was putting together a newsletter for my street when I was in fifth grade or when I was in second grade, I guess. And then in fifth grade, I wrote my first book, if you could call it that. It was called um, Real Kids Don't Eat Spinach. It was a, a a play off of a popular book at the time. I don't know if you remember this book at all, but it was called Real Men Don't Eat Quiche. And um, I was only a kid when it came out, but it was a kind of a popular joke book about how real men are supposed to act. And uh, I wrote one about how real kids were supposed to act. And it just kept adding pages to this clipboard that I had, you know, notebook pages on. But um, I, it, I think, you know, of course, the book never got sent out or any, nobody ever did anything with the book. It's in a box under my mom's bed, I guess. But, um, <laughs> but, but the instinct was in me right from the start to be writing and telling stories. And uh, by the time I was in college, I knew that I wanted to study to be a writer and actually took a specialized uh, undergraduate degree at the University of Tennessee to, to, to study creative writing. Um, and so it's, it's been a drive for me, you know, those, those eight, nine or 10 years where I was, where I was writing stuff and sending it out and and collecting rejection letters. It was tough because I I really did want to sell something, but I think I knew I was always going to be doing this. I mean, maybe now if, if, you know, if it were another 10 or 20 years later and, and, and I were still going and, and, and I wasn't selling anything, I would probably give up because the writing would be on the wall. (laughs) But, but even then, even then I was willing to stick it out because I really, I was confident that I could get better, that I could get good enough to sell something. Um, you know, each time I wrote something, I thought this is good enough. It's good enough to sell. I know it is. And it took me a few of those times getting better and better and better to realize that, that I wasn't good enough that first time or the second time or the third time. Um, and that, but, but as I stuck with it, I was seeing more and more, um, uh, optimistic letters back from editors and agents and, and felt, just that that little sense of encouragement, I guess, was enough to 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 feed me. Sure, sure. So what? So given all of that, what was your experience like when you when you uh, finally got the acceptance for your first novel, Samurai Shortstop? Do you remember that? Oh yeah, very clearly. Um, <laughs> we were living in Knoxville. Yeah, we were living in Knoxville, Tennessee, which is where I'm uh, from originally. We'd moved back there, and uh, I had. Um, uh, I, I had quit my job, as a matter of fact, to stay home and be a writer, but actually more to be a full-time dad. My daughter, uh, my daughter Jo, J-O, was, um, was born, and my, both my wife and I had full-time jobs. And the option right away was, do we send her off to daycare every day, or do we have one of us quit our job and stay home and take care of her? And my wife had the the much better paying job, and she knew that my dream had always been to be a writer. And in fact, I'd been taking the last few years in my evenings and weekends and and summers to write books. I'd been teaching uh, eighth grade English. And uh, she said, quit your job, stay home, take care of Joe and put more time into your writing, sell a book for real, like get it done. And it was that push, that decision that meant everything. So it was um, Joe, Joe had not celebrated her first birthday when I got the call that uh, an editor wanted to buy Samurai Shortstop. And uh, I, I did a happy dance in the living room. I, um, <laughs> I remember being home that day and, and you know, being a, being a, a parent of, of, a, of, a, of a baby, being a new parent, you're more a parent than anything. I mean, I was doing more, more stay-at-home dad than I was doing writing, but I was yeah. still finding time during nap times and, and during times when Wendy could take over. Uh, and just remain disciplined. And it was kind of the reward for all those many years of plugging away at it and the reward for making that big decision to quit my job and to stay home. We couldn't have done it for very long. Um, it, it's not like Wendy's job was making so much that we could live on one salary forever, but we had enough put away and I had, a, and I had done enough work. I had, I had written enough and, and been putting it, novels out there and getting enough buzz about my work that we felt like I was on the cusp of something. Uh, it still might not have happened, and I might have had to go back to teaching in a year or two. Uh, but we were really fortunate that somebody uh, did like Samurai enough to buy it, and, and that kicked me off. And I, uh, I've never looked back. I've been a full-time writer um, since my daughter was born, and that's she's uh, 10 years old now. And it's easy for me to clock my career by how old she is. <laughs> that's great. Well, I know that you um, recently wrote, uh, or recently a couple of years ago, wrote a YA uh, tie-in novel to the last Star Trek movie. Are you looking forward yes. to? The, are you looking forward to the new movie this summer? Oh yeah! And while I was here, I pulled up the. Uh, while I was here at this retreat I'm at right now, I pulled up the uh, the trailer 
for the, the newest trailer for that movie. I'm excited about it. I'm a little nervous because, um, you know, Star Trek movies have a habit of being good and then bad and then good and then bad. And I, I rather liked the first of the new ones. So I'm, I'm, I'm kind of nervous about this one, but, <laughs> um, but I, I've been a Star Trek fan for a long, long time, and uh, you know I have some pictures that I drew when I was a kid of the of the Enterprise from watching reruns of the old uh, original series, and um, and then uh, really enjoyed the the Next Generation when I was in high school and college, and um, and have continued to be a big fan of the show and all its iterations since then. And um, when I saw that Simon and Schuster was doing uh, young adult. Star Trek novels based on the reboot movie of 2009. I uh, I called up my agent and I was like, "Hey, Star Trek young adult, this is like me right now. I need to, you know, how do we get in touch with these folks?" Um, and uh, I had to actually con- sort of the first thing you have to do in a job like that is you have to convince them that you know what you're talking about. You you have to, you know, a lot of people want to write for Star Trek, but you need to tell them like I know my stuff, and so. Um, I wrote what I what I jokingly referred to on the, on on the paper as my Starfleet Academy um, uh, entrance exam or my my um, uh, college essay, and uh, and and wrote them uh, wrote all about my experience with the show from all the years watching it to role playing it to all the books that I owned in the Star Trek universe and that sort of thing and. Um, I, I pretty easily convinced them that I was a person who could knowledgeably write for Star Trek, <laughs> and. Um, uh, I, I, um, I got the gig and then, but then had to pitch them story ideas and, and it had to go through not only Simon and Schuster, but also CBS Paramount who owned the rights to it on the TV side and bad robot, the JJ Abrams company that's producing the new feature right. films. Right. So there were many cooks involved in that, in that stew of that novel, um, but it was a fun experience, and uh, it was kind of a bucket list thing for me to write a Star Trek novel. Um, that had always been uh, a, a kind of a little uh, daydream of mine to write a Star Trek novel, and um, it finally came true when I was able to write this one. I really enjoyed the the first of the reboot films, and and so it was fun to to take their takes on the characters. It was it was also nice because it didn't have all the baggage of um, you know the the original show and and the 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 next generation shows. Uh, of the nineties, they really, uh, by now there are huge expanded universes, just like there are for the star Wars expanded universe. And there are so many directions. These characters have gone in later books and car- and comics and that sort of thing that it's really Byzantine. But with these guys, with these characters, they had just been rebooted in 2009. And so there wasn't, there wasn't a lot that I had to, to know about these other than the inspiration for them from the original series and what had been done with them in the, in the, in the movie, but I had a blast writing that. And, um, I, I hope I get to write one again someday. I'm, I'm hoping that the, uh, that the, the new movie coming out this year will rekindle interest in that series and that maybe they'll, they'll do more of those. Gotcha. Gotcha. Well, I know when we were setting up this interview, you, you were attending a writing retreat. Were you doing mm-hmm. that as a teacher? Yeah. Um, when, when you first contacted me, I was actually at, uh, at one of the highlights workshops, uh, you know, the highlights magazine that, that many people experience when they're in the doctor's office, <laughs> um, the highlights magazine for kids, uh, the, they are located in Honesdale, Pennsylvania, and they have, a uh, a, an estate, a, 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 a compound. Uh, I don't, that, that makes it sound like end times kind of stuff, but they, they have a, <laughs> They have a, a a center, a facility where they have a, a big house, a big meeting space, and then they have cabins set up around. Or, and and you can and they have um, all through the year they have lots of different uh, writing programs. And that when you contacted me, I was teaching at the whole novel workshop for a week. It's where um, writers from around the country bring their finished manuscripts, but unsold manuscripts, and um, the instructors read those and and critique the entire novel. And then we spend the week with the students, uh, helping them craft a revision. It, it's a really great and immersive way. If you're a, an unpublished writer to get a published writer to, to read your book and to really work with you one-on-one all through the week. And it's the second time I've done that. And, uh, they're great folks up at highlights. I, that's a program I, I really think is a strong one. And there are a lot of college programs now that, that are for, the writing for young readers. Um, and, but, the, but they take a couple of years and they're, um, they're very expensive. 
And this is a nice way to to get that specialized treatment on just one book in in a very short amount of time, and and not have to spend nearly as much as you do on a um, on a graduate program. Um, so I was uh, I I taught at that one, and then but there are other writing retreats like the one I'm at right now, where I'm there um, not as a student or a teacher, but just as a as a writer. Um, I'm I'm currently in Kill Devil Hills, North Carolina, um, on the Outer Banks on the ocean, and uh, um, I've been working all week on revising a project that I haven't sold, that, and I've just been here with a, with about thirteen other writers, and uh, all of whom are working on their individual projects. And we work during the days, and then we relax in the evenings and, and talk business and talk craft. And um, it's been really fantastic. Uh, it's it's actually my second week in a row of retreats. It wasn't meant to be that way. I, it's uh, I'm, I'm a little bit retreated out. I'm ready to get home. Um, <laughs> But the week before this, I was in Bat Cave, North Carolina, for a, another writer's retreat that was specifically about writing for kids. This one's about writing for uh, science fiction and fantasy, but for all ages. So um, I still get to some of those retreats on my own to work on my own craft as a writer. And then um, uh, I'm fortunate enough to, to be invited to somewhere. I, I'm also working with students and helping them to get their first books sold. Gotcha. So, so what general advice do you have for aspiring writers who may be listening and, and want to uh, have their own novels and short stories published? Sure. I, I, you know, I, I get asked this a lot, and um, I, it, what I'm going to say is probably the same kind of thing that, that most writers will tell you. Um, but I do think that the number one thing is persistence. Um, I wouldn't be where I am if I had sent out my first novel and, and let it be rejected and then just let that be that. I wouldn't be where I am if I had sent out my second novel and let it be rejected and, and let that be that. You know, I was, I'm really fortunate that it was the third novel that I wrote that I, that I actually sold. I know people who've gone through 10 novels and until they've sold their first one. And um, it's, a, it's a matter of whether you really want to be a writer or not. And if, you're, if you do, the more writing you put in, the more persistent you are, the better you'll get. And eventually you'll get to the point where your work is sellable and publishable and you will find somebody out there who sees your book the same way you do, an editor or a publisher, who see the value in your work and, and want to publish you. Um, there are all kinds of alternatives for people to, to quickly publish today, to, to jump into ebook publishing or to self-publishing. And that works for a lot of people. Some people have been able to really make that work. Um, but I really wanted to be paid for my work up front. I wanted to get an advance. I wanted to get royalties. Um, I wanted to go the traditional route. This was also, you know, 10 years ago, uh, mm-hmm. and it was a very different publishing world 10 years ago. Right. Um, so there are a lot more alternatives now, but I would, I would encourage people not to give up too easily and not to say, well, I, I just don't want to go through the rigmarole of traditional publishing. I'm just going to self publish. Um, I would encourage people to still try very hard to get published traditionally. Um, that that's coming from somebody who's traditionally published, um, but I, uh, I I really value the editorial process more than anything, and that's my big thing. Um, that that working with the editors at at traditional houses have made my books a thousand times better. I'm not sure I would really want to publish my first or third or fourth drafts, um, not until an editor has seen them and worked with me on them. Um, but persistence uh, and, and dedication to the craft. Go to classes, take classes online, buy books about writing, study plot structure, study character development, um, read other people's books. And, um, you know, I, I have often told people I, I love fanfic. I mean, I haven't written a ton of it, um, but you could argue that my Star Trek novel is just getting paid to write fanfic. And I had written some Star Trek fan fiction before that on my own because I was so into the world. Um, I think I think a fanfic, much the way that same, some people, uh, like art students, are told to go to museums and they set up their easels in front of a masterwork and they try to reproduce it. And to my mind, fan fiction is, is taking a lot of things from a world. You, it takes away the world-building aspect for you, and then it lets you focus on how to write. And if coming up with characters and a world is daunting – for you, then find somebody else's and practice in that world. I mean, obviously you're, unless you, unless you get a chance to write for Star Trek or something like that, you're not going to make money off of that, but it's a great way to, to practice 
to emulate the masters or at least to emulate the people that you admire, if, even if it's not masterwork. Um, and uh, I think if you do all those things and, and stick with it, um, I, I, think that, I think that publishing is a very attainable dream for, for, for many people. Great, great. So, so what are some of the books and authors that you've read in the past year or two, fiction or nonfiction, that made an impression on you and that you would recommend? Uh, Anything come to yeah, mind? Yeah, gosh. Um, you know, and, and here I am. I make a list of all the books I've read. Um, and uh, here I am uh, uh, traveling from home. Or otherwise, I could open it up and remind myself. I'm so bad about remembering what I've read. Um, I mean, remembering like the list of things that I've read. I'm trying to think now what I've read lately that I'm a big, big fan of. I read both adult and kid stuff. I read The One and Only Ivan, the Newbery winner from this year. It was terrific. Uh, I read that just recently. Um, I have been, I've been on an Agatha Christie kick. I've, I love Agatha Christie's novels, especially the, Her, the Hercule Poirot ones, and decided like late last year that I would try and re, that I would read through all of the Poirot novels in order, uh, rereading many of them that I'd already read and then, and then catching a lot that I hadn't. And so I'm about six or seven novels into that reread, and I'm, and I'm having a blast with that. Although it's really been interesting that some of them are really terrible. Like a couple of the early Poirot novels are really bad. And when I looked it up, I found out like she was, you know, going through a divorce at the time and, and needed the money and, and knocked one of these out. And, um, <laughs> it, it's kind of, it's kind of refreshing to, to read about, to, to, to see a, a person who's a master like Agatha Christie, who had some real stinkers and to realize that we we all get, we all get a few of those in there that just don't work out the way you thought they were going to. And, and that you kind of wish you could sweep under the rug. Right. Um, but uh, I'm a big fan of the um, Patrick O'Brien um, novels, the Aubrey Martin uh, Maturin novels, mm-hmm. and uh, the you know the Master and Commander. And I've sure. been I read one of those recently. I also got into a kick of rereading. I, I love graphic novels and comic books, and um, I pulled out recently the the um, James Robinson Starman uh, comics. And, and I'm a this was a a run of comics where he he set out with a with a story to tell. And he, and he told the editor, like, I'm going to be done around issue number 80. This was never going to be an ongoing comic. And I think that, that that's fascinating because it allows him to do things with the characters uh, in, a, in a way that, that soap operas and comic books usually don't see. You know, usually the characters in those, they, they never really change and grow because they can't. It's a serial. You know, it's always the same character over and over again. And um, this was a, this was a comic book that 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 where he he had a, a deliberate storyline and and when he was done he was done he said I'm done you know and Starman ended and it was a great book and it had a lot of readers at the time and but he had finished the story and and Starman's never been back and um, so I'm rereading those and really enjoying that um, I'm trying to think of anybody right. any other kids books I've read I've been because uh, I try to work in a lot of kids books um, along with my my passions as an adult reader. Um, but now I'm blanking, of course. Okay, not a problem. <laughs> but, that's, not a problem. but that's a few well, things that I've been into, sure, sure. some of it rereading and some of it new reads for me. Sure. So do you know what your next novel will be after your latest novel, which is out now, Prisoner B3? I do. And, and what yeah. Uh, what's coming after Prisoner is a, a book called The League of Seven, or at least a series called The League of Seven. The first book in that is called Mangleborn. And um, this is a uh, a book that I wrote that it's going to be a trilogy, and I just sold it to uh, to Tor. And the first book is written in that, and and is actually into copy edits, uh, copy edits. And um, that book will come out in uh, I think spring of 2014, uh, either that or summer of 2014, but but next year. And the the League of Seven is about it's middle grade, and it's about uh, seven super powered kids who come together in an alternate America it's set in the 1870s um, to, um, to, to defeat these giant monsters that, that, that sleep under the ground and, and awaken whenever electricity is developed. And uh, it's a, um, a steam powered world because every time we develop electricity, these monsters arise and crush everything. And so then we develop steam power. And if we forget after generations and generations of these monsters being gone, and then we, tinker with electricity. And as soon as we do that back, they come. And so Thomas Edison is actually a big villain in my book. And, um, 
it's his experimentation with electricity that's beginning to wake the old ones. And, um, <laughs> and these kids have to, have to try and take down Thomas Edison and the big bads. Um, so I, I've really been having a lot of fun with that. And, uh, um, that, like I said, that's a trilogy, and those are going to come out every nine months. So um, th- those will be kind of jam packed into 2014 and 2015, and and maybe right into the beginning of 2016. I, I'm not doing my math right. It might just be two year run, um, but those will be the next books I have out. Very different, of course, from Prisoner B3087. Um, but that's one of the things I love too about uh, writing for young readers is that really there are. There are an infinite number of genres within the age group, whereas when you write for adults, oftentimes you write just science fiction or just fantasy or just mystery. And if you go outside that genre, then people are like, whoa, 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 what are you doing here? And with young readers, um, there's so much more freedom to jump around and pursue my own crazy interests because um, I'm writing for the 12-year-old me. I mean, that's what I'm always doing is writing the books that the 12 year old me would have seen on the shelf and said, I got to pick that up. I got to read that. Right. So it's baseball, it's history. Um, it's true stories. Sometimes it's, it's fantasy. Um, it's science fiction. I, I loved all that stuff as a kid. And, and I get to, um, I get to be a jack of all trades. Maybe that means I'm a master of none, but at least I get to be a jack <laughs> of all trades when I write for kids. That's great. Well, where can people find you online? Um, my website is alangratz.com, and it's A-L-A-N-G-R-A-T-Z dot com. And that has links to a blog that I write with my wife, and, and uh, it has information about my books. I'm on Facebook. I'm Alan Gratz on Facebook, and I'm Alan Gratz on Twitter. And uh, Twitter is actually my, my favorite of the social media. I, I tweet a lot. So that's those are the places you can find me. Great. Well, again, we've been speaking with Alan Gratz. Alan's latest novel, Prisoner B3087, is available in bookstores now, so please check it out. Alan, thanks for doing the interview. It was my great pleasure. Thanks a lot.